Okay, uh, I think, can everyone see this now? This is module five today. And the usual creative column, co commons. And so what we're gonna be talking about is gene finding with artificial neural nets today. And there is a change in the schedule. So we're gonna be, for those of you on Eastern time, starting, well, now it's about 10 after 10. We're gonna go until noon. So instead of an hour and a half, this is gonna be almost two hours. We're gonna have a break. And then we're going to go into uh, module six and seven, which are dealing with um, uh, machine learning with Keras and Scikit-learn. Um, hopefully these will be a little shorter. Um, they'll give you more time to do things. And then we'll wrap up today with a module on, on information extraction and coding with chat GPT. Um, so um, minor change to the schedule, just take note. Um, and I'll try and also have a little bit of a break because sitting for two hours is a long time. Um, so this is about gene prediction. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk about prokaryotic gene prediction, partly because it's a, easier um, than eukaryotic gene prediction, but I think it's a really useful example. Um, and we're gonna talk about how it can be done, how it can be assessed. We're gonna look at some uh, Python code for um, different methods to predict prokaryotic genes. Uh, we're not going to use the HMM here, so I think that's something I should have fixed up before tonight or last night. Um, the key thing here, and I'll start off and I'll emphasize this, this is, is not like secondary structure, which we did last night. Um, it is to show how, uh, and it's an illustration of how feature selection and how smart analysis of your problem can make a huge difference to the performance of a machine learning algorithm. So it's an illustrative example. So it's not just, oh, let's do the same old thing that we've been doing before. It's, it's partly to show you, um, you know, a real process, um, how, you know, naively you'd want to try it this way. Here's the result you get. You find it's not as good as you tr would hope. You try another way, still not as good. And then you try, in this case, smart feature selection, and you get a radical improvement in your performance. So that's, that's the whole point of this particular um, lesson. Okay, so background, I think everyone knows this stuff, but you know, there is a genetic code. Um, there's 64 different types of codons. Codons are these three base um, words, if you want to call them that, uh, that code for different amino acids. There are start codons. Well, there's one in particular, that's the ATG or AUG start codon. And there's three stop codons, um, TAA, TAG, TGA. And of course, this is using uracil, which is the, actually the RNA uh, version of things, which is probably the correct way of thinking about it. So the genetic code's been known since the 1960s. Um, we can use simple programs to do um, translation. So if we find a gene, we can then figure out what that gene codes for, at least those protein coding genes. And we can talk about forward strand and reverse strand um, because DNA is a double stranded helix. Um, so the forward strand, which is at the top, traditionally um, we're showing how it can translate. There's a frame one, there's a frame two, there's a frame three, we can shift things. Um, and then the, the reverse strand, um, we read the other direction. Um, we can create a reverse complement, which allows us to lead you know, from left to right. But I'm just showing what it would be like if we were reading from right to left. And again, we can see frame minus one, frame minus two, and frame minus three. So technically any given strand of DNA can code for six different reading frames. Um, Again, I think everyone knows that. Uh, just a quick review about prokaryotic gene structures. Um, prokaryotes have really simple gene structure. Typically they'll have um, some upstream signaling um, uh, components. Uh, the most common one is called a Tata box. These are maybe hundred bases upstream. They have a start codon, they have a stop codon. Um, the genes in prokaryotes are just typically called open reading frames. So they don't have interrupted genes like eukaryotes. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to find things. Uh, I'm just showing a segment where we've got a gene or a pretend gene. Uh, and we've got the green start codon and the red stop codon, ATG. 
is to start codons for more than 90, 95% of genes, and, and then the stop codons, any one of three. And again, there's different reading frames, but once the gene is being read, it's, um, it sticks with one reading frame. So um, some of you, maybe if you've done some coding, maybe that was the very first real program you wrote uh, in biology was to do gene finding, which is open reading frame. You know. So you start with a, a long gene segment or a long piece of DNA, um, and you scan until you find a start codon, and that defines your you know, reading frame, and then you stay in the same reading frame uh, and scan in groups of three until you find a stop codon. Uh, now, if that uh, segment or open reading frame is long enough, usually you might say 40 or 50 um, codons, 40 or 50 bases, whatever you want to choose. Uh, you say, okay, that's a gene. Um, and if that's less than that, it's not uh, a gene. Um, and then once you've found um, the end of the stop codon, um, then you go to the next um, thing I can bring back to this top of the um, algorithm, you scan forward again. Um, now, in this case, um, if you're avoiding nested genes, you might you know, jump to the complete next gene, or you might then start scanning within the same you know, open reading frame that you've just identified and look for another start codon. Um, anyways, it's, it's a fairly simple algorithm. It's just looking for starts and stop points. And, in both the forward reading frame and the reverse reading frame. There are web servers. Um, NCBI offers one, which is just a simple uh, ORF finder. You can paste in tens of thousands or a few thousand bases, and it'll identify the open reading frames. It'll show you the direction. Uh, it numbers them. It tells you the start, stop, the length. Um, the strand, the frame type, and so on. Uh, and then you can translate and do blast searches on that. Again, um, for people who've done prokaryotic genetics, this is pretty simple stuff. It's not the most sophisticated, um, but it's, it's um, the way prokaryotic genes often are found. Now, if it's prokaryotic or even eukaryotic gene prediction, there's formal ways of evaluating how well you're doing. So in light blue um, is say the, the genes that have been identified in this DNA segment. And then you have some ORF finder, or this could also be exons and introns. Um, so blue is exon, blank line is an intron. Um, either way, whether it's prokaryotic or eukaryotic, you can use this concept of um, comparing actual to predicted and if when blue matches with red, uh, that's the true positive. When red um, matches with the, the blank line, if you want, that's a false positive. Uh, when the blank line or simple line matches um, actual and predicted, that's a true negative. And when the prediction doesn't make any kind of prediction, so it's the blue matches to a, a straight line, uh, that's called a false negative. So this is the same concept of the confusion matrix um, that we talked about before. And it also gives us the same way of calculating things like sensitivity and specificity. Uh, there are other calculations that people use. Some people use precision and correlation, um, with, which have different formulas, um, but to measure how well things are, are being done. And, and you can measure it at the gene level, or you can measure it at the uh, base level in terms of your performance. So here we're measuring basically at the base level, uh, where we're counting bases as which ones are false positive, which ones are true negatives and true positives. Uh, if we were counting at the gene level, every one of these predictions would be considered you know, completely wrong uh, because they didn't get a complete match all the way through. Um, the sensitivity has a formal calculation formula. We've given, I think, that before last time. The specificity is also a, a calculation for precision. Um, again, these are all things you can look up, but this is how overall gene prediction, gene evaluation is done. 
we'll use this later on when we talk about the performance of this gene predictor or, or finder. Um, so we can have a set of uh, start codons. Um, the ATG is the most common for 95%. There's a couple of rarer start codons, GTG and TTG. And then there's these sort of universal stop codons, TAA, TAT, TGA. Um, so, you know, for a large prokaryotic genome, three or four million bases, uh, you can, you know, find all the start and stop codons, both for the forward uh, and reverse um, strands. Now, not all of those ORFs will be genes. Um, and you'll see some numbers here about how many ORFs you can actually find in a prokaryotic gene. And it's a lot. So here's a little animation where we're going through a DNA segment of about, I don't know, 40 bases. And we're sliding around along um, three bases at a time, or one base with a codon search. And we're de determining whether something is a start codon. So if there's an ATG, that's a start. Um, then we'll have to slide along a little bit further. And this is a stop. And each time we find it, we add a number to our list of starts and stops. Um, and so what you have to do is track which reading frame you were in. Um, and you can choose a arbitrary start. If the T here is reading frame one, the G beside it is reading frame two, and the G after that is reading frame three. Um, so we're just keeping track of the starts, stops, and the frame that things are happening in. And again, that's a trivial way to write a program. Um, and so with that, as I said, if you have you know, 3 million bases, scan through it, forward and reverse strand, uh, we can identify a, a start and a stop. Uh, and we can see a whole bunch of start and stops that were done on the forward. And then we looked at the reverse complement. And there are also others that are um, starts and stops. But what's marked in red are the ones which were wrong, and in green, the ones that were correct. Um, and that's the typical thing that happens with just simple or finding because um, there are uh, literally millions of ORFs in a genome of three to four million bases. Okay, so the first thing we're going to try and do is just a really simple open reading frame finder using the algorithms that I've just described and pictured and animated. So we're not going to force you to write it. Um, we're going to go to um, module five. Uh, we're going to open the Python code for that. Um, and we're going to find the ORF finder. It should be o RF rather than OPF. Um, and select that in Google Colab. So the, the general algorithm is just like everything else. We read the data. Um, then we verify the data set um, to look for sort of missing data or anything else. We're going to create a function uh, called codons, and we're going to have a list of the start and stop points. We're going to identify all the start and stop codon pairs in all three reading frames. Um, and um, then we're going to match them in the same reading frame. So if we've got a start and a stop in reading frame one, that's uh, an OPORF. Uh, we're going to use a, an OR function to match a minimum ORF length of 40 bases. We could have set 40 um, codons, that could have been 120 bases. But there are some really short genes, it turns out, in prokaryotes. So this one's something um, that's useful. There's also something that's been noted over time that um, some cases um, genes read through stop codons. Um, so we can we'll also identify uh, pairs of start and stop codons where there's up to three stop codons in the same reading frame. Uh, and then we're going to create another function just called ORF finder, uh, which is different than ORF and different than codons. Uh, and we're running it. And then, of course, we can do this on the reverse strand as well. Then we're also going to um, determine how many of these ORFs, because we have a reference set um, of, in this case, E. coli gene where the ORFs are, have been correctly identified through years of hard work. So if we were writing this um, on your own, you would import, as we've always done, uh, NumPy and Pandas. Uh, we are aliasing them, um, just to keep things a little simple. So NumPy is NPy, and, or NumPy and Pandas is PD. 
Um, we're reading the genome sequence here. Um, so we're going to read the, both the forward and reverse strand and produce a reverse complement. Uh, we're cleaning up some of the gene um, um, tags or descriptors here, um, just to make sure that we've got the sequence as we wish. So getting rid of the first line. Um, this is the missing values and data check. Uh, we've done this before. And there's a, a verify data set function. Uh, and we're looking to see if there's any missing data in our columns. Um, and since we're dealing with sequence data, it's almost never missing data. Um, of course, there could be all kinds of X's and other things, and that probably should have been added to this particular um, code. But um, And then the codons, um, one which are um, the start codons, um, and then the other one, which is the stop codon set. Um, so we're creating list one uh, for start codons and list two for stop codons. Uh, and then we're counting um, as we go through this. So again, this is just a, a small function. Um, and this is where we're now scanning for ORFs. Uh, we're looking over three different frames. So we start at zero, one, and two, uh, as opposed to one, two, and three. Um, so once we're in position frame one, we'll look at the first codon. If it's a start, we add it to a start codon list. If it's a stop codon, we add it to the stop codon list. And then once all the codons in that current frame, if it's frame one or zero in this case, uh, then we move to the next frame, which is uh, from zero to one or one to two. Um, so you're seeing list one uh, and list two, uh, which are capturing those start and stop codons as we plug away. Um, so essentially what you got um, is, you know, given frame one, the green codons are the start ones, the red ones are the stop codons. We're building this list of frame one stop codons, frame one start codons, frame two start codons, frame two stop codons. And um, we have to identify that for a given start codon, if it's at 190, something that has a stop codon that's less than 190 is not possible. Uh, but if it's greater than 190, and if it's greater than 190 plus 40, it's potentially a, a valid uh, stop codon. Um, so this is where we've got a minimum length that says we can keep that. Um, and then we can, based on knowing which frame we've been working in, we can say this is the start um, and, and codon. So again, this is what the ORF finder is doing. Um, now, the other point we've had, which is at least for genes, and this is something people observed, is that you can have up to three stop codons uh, in some genes, uh, or at least where two are ignored and the last one is, is, is kept. So um, this is a, a trick uh, to account for the possibility of finding the correct uh, start codon, but the wrong stop codon. Um, and again, this is you know data that that um, people who have studied prokaryotic genes have learned about. And this is another point where I guess we're using um, feature um, information or feature selection to say, hey, we just can't use only the simple rule that as soon as you find a stop code on, that's the end of it. Likewise, uh, if you recall at the beginning, there's also a couple of other alternate uh, start codons. So again, this is knowledge or feature selection that we're technically embedding into this program. But it's not a machine learning program. It's just wisdom. And um, I think that's, you know, nothing beats having some experience or wisdom when you're coding. Um, then um, we're having uh, we have the ORF um, function. This is the official ORF finder function, um, which is the third function I talked about. Um, runs the previous functions um, on the list of start codons and re returns the list of all ORF predictions. And in this case, it's going to make a comparison between the um, correct ORFs, core ORFs, uh, and incorrect ORFs, in core ORFs. And this is where we're able to look up um, you know, the, the reference set of known open reading frames for the genome that we're analyzing. So um, we can run this um, looking at, um, in this case, the E. coli genome. Uh, we're choosing E. coli K12 because it's probably the best studied 
proto prokaryotic organism. Um, it is a reference genome. It's been widely used in prokaryotes. We know the exact number of protein genes, 4,407. We know the exact length of the genome, 4.6 million bases. Uh, you can go to the NC um, identifier, so NC00913.3. This is the reference genome for K12, um, and it has the list of the correct gene locations. The first gene starts at 337 uh, and goes on, and we also know the reverse complement ones. So all this data is available. This is our gold standard. Um, I actually spent a good part of my early uh, academic career working on annotating E. coli genomes. This is also another reason why we've chosen it. Um, and uh, if we run our simple ORF finder, um, when we're looking at the 4.6 million bases using the methods where we, you know, accounting for extra uh, stop codons, using minimum gene lengths, which we know about already, um, using um, you know, sort of multiple start codons, including ATG and GTG, um, we get uh, 4,282 correct genes identified. So that's a little over 91%. However, we overpredict 1.6 million genes. Um, so if we put in our um, confusion um, matrix, we get a, a nice score of 0.91 for the predicted genes and actual genes. Um, and in terms of uh, non-predicted genes and um, actual genes, we get basically a score of zero, which is terrible. And in terms of over-prediction, we get 0.9999, which is rounded up to one, um, which is absolutely terrible. Um, so if you wanted to use an OR finder, even as one that's as sophisticated as this one, because it can account for alternate start and stop codons and a bunch of other things, um, it overpredicts by a huge margin. Uh, so this would be a total disaster if we were trying to do gene prediction. It's also a reason why people don't generally use ORF finding for prokaryotic gene finding anymore. Um, but um, this is what happens when you um, attempt to write a, a rational program for gene finding. Any comments or questions at this point? OK, so this is, um, let's say, it's an example of, OK, you know, let's try and do it the, the rational way. Let's try and do this um, the machine learning way. Um, so we know that the or finding approach doesn't work. So let's try an artificial neural net. So we, we're going to use the standard workflow. Um, we've seen this diagram before, and we've pitched the proposal is how do I find genes in a prokaryotic DNA sequence? Um, so what we would do, uh, and most of us probably would say, this problem is actually pretty similar to what we were doing yesterday, which is, you know, we take a sequence, in that case it was a protein sequence, and we're trying to find locations of st strings of C's for coils, H's for helices, and B's for beta strands. Um, in gene finding, we could do the same thing, except the sequence is not um, amino acid alphabet, it's a DNA alphabet, so it's simpler. And instead of three states, it's just two states. There's non-coding, which are Ns, and codings, which are Cs. Um, so this is um, the way that we could probably um, draw it out and the way that we could imagine how to code this. Um, so if we're going to do the ANN, then we have to find our training set. So the training set is the same training set that we uh, were testing our algorithm, our ORF finder on. So the NC00913 E. coli uh, set with the 4.6 million bases, uh, where all the start and end gene locations have been given, both in the forward and the reverse complement. 
And again, the same data that we've been compiling since 2005 about their ORFs and what they, where they're located and what they are. Um, so we have a really good gold data set to train on, and we can do the same thing where we you know, choose 70% to train and 30% to test. So we've already decided we're gonna be doing an, an artificial neural net. We also know that we have to sort of do sort of some feature selection and data set transformations. So um, we can do the same thing that we did with the protein um, searches, the protein secondary structure prediction, which is to encode it just like we did with amino acids, which through one hot encoding. Uh, so we can encode nucleotides using sort of a four base structure. You know, A is a 1000, C 0100, G 0010, and T 0001. It could do it even less. You could just have a, you know, I think a three bit coding if you wanted to save space or time. The output uh, will just be a zero or a one um, with zero for coding uh, sequence and one for non coding. Um, now, you guys might remember for the protein structure, we had to insert these dummy variables or null amino acids. Um, and that's because, you know, the secondary structure can start in the first or the second amino acid. It could also carry on to the very last amino acid. With genes, it's, it's not typical. Um, so we can kind of ignore the null characters. Uh, it's also a case that we're looking at the sequences that are millions of bases opposed to you know, hundreds of amino acids. So this is a, a slight approximation just to simplify the code. Um, so in concept, um, although we're using a slightly different alphabet, um, you know, here's this training set. Um, or I, I don't have, um, I guess I could have put in a C here too, but we've got the A's, the T's and the G's. Uh, we have coding and non-coding uh, marked as zeros and ones. Uh, we can imagine that we have a sliding window where we're moving along uh, one codon at a time. So that means if we've got three, or as, no, I think we'll be using four, four um, letters for each base um, or three letters, we would have an input vector of nine characters at three or 12 characters. And then our output character um, is either a one or a zero. And the window that we're actually looking at um, would give us um, a non-coding um, prediction. So we would have our, as we sort of illustrated with the protein secondary structure, we could have you know a codon. Um, one hot encoded, we'd have a weight matrix, uh, we would calculate sort of those intermediate values, uh, then we'd have another weight matrix, um, and then calculate um, the output. And in this case, maybe the output isn't exactly one, it's close. We go through some back propagation to adjust the uh, hidden layer and the output or input layer, as we talked about before. So things get changed. Then we do another fee for analysis. And we do this over and over and over again. So this is thousands of steps later. And we find that now it's um, climbed up from 0.74 to uh, 0.91. And maybe at that point, it's we feel that it's converged. Um, we might then train on a second input and we do this for all the codons. So we're you know, training through many thousands of runs, dozens of epochs, and again, modifying the weight matrices until things, uh, in this case, also converge to one. Um, and finally, after all of that, you have your generalized weight matrices, um, which could be used to identify codons with an artificial neural net. So very similar in concept, just sort of different um, um, encoding or one hot encoding because of the alphabet size and, and um, the output um, values being just binary Ns or Cs. Um, so this is, um, again, the windowing that we're gonna use for, we're using rather than, I think, um, just a three base, uh, window we're using multiple bases, more than three. Um, we're not using a null input. So if we're just sliding things along, in this case, it's a, it's a residue or window of about 12 bases that we're sliding along. 
And that means we're going to miss the, the first uh, five or last five bases in our prediction. Uh, I think, uh, question, sorry, there's a question from Nazia. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Nazia, go ahead. Um, thanks. I just also typed it in the chat. So my question was, do you randomly generate the weight matrix one hidden layer and weight matrix two? And how do you decide on the dimension of these matrices? Thank you. So um, it's very similar to what we did yesterday for the protein one. So in fact, yes, the weight matrices initi are initiated with random numbers, usually between sort of zero and one. Uh, and the dimensionality of the matrices is partly dictated by your one hot encoding rule. Um, so if we're using an output of just a zero and a one, um, then that changes sort of the dimensions of what your um, um, hidden layers or middle layers might be. That means they're probably going to be pretty small. Uh, your input, again, we've been, we're encoding things um, and the window sizes that we're using is going to you know, dictate how big that uh, input matrix is. So how you encode or how you embed um, sort of dictates um, how big those weight matrices will be, or at least their dimensions. Okay, um, so for our input, we decided to use a window of 17. And for our base, um, annotation or one hot encoding, we used a four string or four bit string. So um, that means it's going to be 17 by four is the um, window or input code um, or encoding that we'll be using. And as I said before, we're, we're sliding the window along. It's very much like what we did for the protein secondary structure. And in fact, with protein secondary structure, I think we used the same window length of 17. Um, and in terms of, we're also replacing the N's and C's with zeros and ones. Um, and this allows us also to identify the positions of start and end, because um, this is um, how we identify our our codon placements, or not our codon, but our gene start and end points. Um, so this gives us a, a sort of a simple output, simple input, simple way of reading things. Everything, so everything is just basically a bunch of zeros and ones, which is what neural nets like. So in this case, uh, we took the 4.6 million bases of E. coli. Uh, we had a training set of 3 million, 3.2 million, and then a test set of 1.3 million. Uh, and we had everything uh, structured so that we had those uh, um, uh, codons or bases um, written out as, as needed and their coding, non-coding regions written out as needed. Um, so we can write out um, what we've visualized or imagined in terms of designing the program. We can go to CoLab and do this. You guys are all familiar with how to select the notebooks, uh, create a new program, start writing. Um, we can do exactly the same thing that we, we did before. Uh, we won't be using Seaborn or Matplotlib uh, for the data visualization, um, but we can um, take all of our gene position data uh, that we had from um, the E. coli uh, NCBI genome um, set. Um, we can import the entire sequence, and we've got both the forward and the reverse complement um, data, just as we did for our OR finder. Um, and then rather than going through everything that we did with the secondary structure algorithm, uh, which because we're going to use a lot of the same things, we did the same, um, you know, the training, we did the calculation of the differences, we had the sigmoidal functions, we had uh, the same um, approaches uh, for um, flattening vectors and everything else. So you could basically use a large portion of the secondary structure um, and then we can look now at the um, gene prediction neural net performance. 
And we can also look at how big the window sizes are because we, we tried 17, we tried nine, we tried seven. Um, and um, I'm just showing the ones that actually performed better. So the initial one of 17 didn't do so well. So we started dialing back and this is the confusion matrix. Um, so remember that in the confusion matrix, the perfect one should be ones on the diagonal and zeros on the off diagonal. Instead of getting ones, we're getting 0.33 and uh, 0.75. So we're doing pretty good at predicting non-coding regions, but not so good at the actual coding regions, but we're not anywhere near the 90% we'd want to be or 95%. And then we have lots of errors around you know, 60% for um, false positives and false negatives. So even though we spent quite a bit of time modifying the code for this one, thinking that it should work just like secondary structure and at least should give us something on the order of you know, 80 or 90%, the neural net was a total failure. And when we actually looked at the output, Instead of saying, you know, clusters of non-coding regions and clusters of coding regions, like you would expect, the actual output is what you're seeing at the very bottom, where you've got Ns and Cs and an N and a C and an N, which is not the way that genes are um, structured. Um, they have to have some continuity. Um, you know, the shortest gene is about 40 bases. The average gene is about um, three or 400 bases. Um, so um, this was not exactly what we wanted to see. Um, and I think um, it was not as if we were um, flailing around. I think we, this is something that we wanted to demonstrate um, for you guys. Um, so we tried different ones to sort of show how you can fail um, with machine learning, where taking sort of a naive approach um, to machine learning and say, okay, it worked for this one, I'll just use the same thing. Or in the case of gene prediction, you know, let's just treat one base at a time and see what we can do. Um, and, and this is a tendency, as I said, with, with especially with sequencing data where it's easy to get terabytes of data and it's all just sequence data. And the thinking is, well, let's just analyze the sequence. Um, we've shown how we could, you know, apply a, a heuristic algorithm for our finding and do a terrible job. This is showing how you can apply a, a standard neural net and also get a terrible result. Um, so it turns out, and this is where, you know, if you read the literature about how people do gene finding for both carrots and eukaryotes, it's not done on a, on a residue by residue or base by base level. Instead, it's, it's essentially thinking about um, smart feature selection. Uh, it's taking what we've learned or what we know about genes and gene features and trying to encode that information into the gene finding algorithm. So what, um, as I said, the, the most important lesson from this particular module is, is not to say or learn additional coding about you know, neural nets. It's about how to do um, smart feature selection or smart uh, feature decision-making as uh, the input for a better algorithm. So some of the things that we can do in this again, by reading the literature, you'd say that you should just include a, more information than standard start and stop codons. We have some of that um, already in the ORF finder uh, that we built at the beginning, having three different start codons. There are also alternate stop codons. Um, we can include codon frequency information. This is something that people have noted for a long time. Uh, preferred types of codons um, for coding regions. There's also preferred bases to be at the start of um, certain codons. Another thing that people found is that um, hexamers, which are two codons or paired codons together, um, tell you a lot. Uh, hexamer frequencies are quite different between coding regions and non-coding regions, between promoters and terminator regions. 
Um, and this has been information that's been known for quite a while. Um, likewise, genes are not just simply start and stop uh, ORFs. They have um, the what's called the RNA polymerase promoter site, the PRIPNO box. And there's also a Shine Delgarno sequence, which is the ribosome binding site. Um, so these are other features um, that can be identified along a genome and are used to flag um, the, the start and end of real genes and to clean up and get rid of the non-genes or non-coding genes. So again, just to remind you about some of these al alternate start, start codons, there's class ones, ATG, GTG, and TTG. There's a couple of other ones, a little, little rarer, CTG, ATT, ATA, and ACG. So one thing to do is to you know, include these ones, uh, the class 2A. The RNA polymerase promoter site, or the PRIBNO box, uh, it has a characteristic conserved sequence. Um, there's the TTGAC, and then there's the TATA, or the TATA box. Um, and so these are located usually about 100 base pairs upstream of the start gene. Um, and it covers a region of about 40 bases or so. Just before the ATG start codon, uh, there's another collection of about six bases called the Shine Delgarno sequence. And it has a general sequence of AGG, AGG, sort of a short repeat. And this is where the ribosome binds the messenger RNA strand. So this is where, again, a lot of genes have this. And that was not part of our gene search. It certainly wasn't part of the um, neural net that we were coding for. There's also things like terminators and stem loops where um, the RNA transcript will sort of fold back on itself and produce a hairpin loop. And this is a, a way of making sure that um, um, the ribosome falls off and that the termination really happens on that gene uh, and that there isn't sort of this read through of, of the ATG or anything else. So these again are another features, although I think in this particular algorithm, we didn't include this. So as I said, what this module really about is about is not so much about you know, gene finding, it's about feature extraction and choosing features that can make a difference and that as a simple, naive applications of machine learning, uh, as we showed with the neural net, can produce abysmal results if you haven't been smart about your feature selection. Um, so feature selection, feature extraction, whatever you want to call it, um, is, is using statistical data or additional information or knowledge or wisdom you have uh, to describe the data. So we can intelligently select the data that will be used in our machine learning model. Um, so what we're really technically doing is trying to uh, contract or, or collapse the sequences. Um, so I'm showing sequence one, two, and three. So these are, let's say they're genes um, and they all have different um, lengths. Some genes are 250, some are 1,500. Um, but I'm trying to convert those sequences and codons into essentially a feature table where it's the same number of features. What's their, you know, hexamer frequency quality score? What's their um, Pribno box score? What's their Tata box score? What's their Shine Delgarno score? What's their um, um, alternate codon score? And so now those scores, which are shown in this bottom table, um, if I've only got five scores for each sequence, then I can determine you know, whether this is a, a good gene or not. Uh, so sequence one has relatively low scores. So I might say it's not a gene. Sequence two has relatively high scores. So it is a gene. Um, sequence three also has low scores. So it's not a gene. Um, and by simplifying it so that I'm not looking at you know, thousands of bases, but instead maybe a set of five features uh, which have specific scores and I've simplified. And we talked about this yesterday where we said, you know, you get some metagenomic sequence and you can say, yeah, I've got you know, billions, billions of sequences. Well, why not just convert those sequences to features? So those sequences could be 
um, you know, class order phylum genus species um, that you've derived from maybe the 16S RNA or some other analysis. Um, they could be, um, you know, just focusing on not only highly conserved portions, but they might be for, you know, certain um, functional genes that are really important. So uh, antibiotic resistance genes. Um, so you're, you're pulling out or teasing out, um, you know, the relevant information from this mess of noise. Um, so that's the essence, if you want, this is maybe the most important slide, is just this point about taking a, a lot of data and trying to extract intelligent, useful features out of it. And it also produces a simpler way of, of handling the data. So instead of dealing with highly variable length sequences, the inputs are always of the same length and of the same scale and of the same range. And that makes it easier for machine learning to, to learn. So I'm gonna stop here for a few minutes, um, partly because technically we've been going for an hour and then the next one will be another hour. So if people need to stretch or if people have some questions, um, we can do that for the next five minutes. There is a question in the Slack from Shoba. Um, would a set of metabolites that are part of a pathway be such a feature extraction in metabolomics? Yeah, um, it, it is. It's a legitimate one. Um, I mean, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it is the basis for a couple of um, techniques that are used um, in metabolomics. Um, mummy chug is a technique um, that's supported by a metabolanalyst, but it sort of views lists of metabolites and converts it to sort of a list of pathways. And uh, it's sometimes it's used to identify potentially missing or unidentified metabolites. It's also sometimes used to um, interpret uh, the metabolomic data in a more complete way. Same sort of thing when you, you know, annotate genes with gene ontologies. So instead of a whole bunch of genes, uh, you know, a thousand genes, maybe it falls, a thousand genes fall into 20 um, gene ontology classes. So when, instead of a thousand inputs, it's now 20 inputs um, that, you know, indicate how many of them are, are present. That simplifies your problem and also allows it to tease, you know, potentially more information out of the, the data. Great. Thank you. There's another question in chat. Um, how is it decided how many hidden layers will be used in the model? So, you know, if, if you're writing it from, you know, pure Python and doing what we're doing, um, usually the you can only get about one or maybe a maximum of two hidden layers because it's just really hard to code. Um, as we'll see later on when you use sklearn and, and um, Keras, it's you just put in a number and it'll handle um, uh, the number of hidden layers you want. As you go from one or two hidden layers, you're using the simple neural net. As you add more hidden layers, uh, you're moving more and more towards a deep neural net, which arguably means the, the model becomes more powerful, but it's gonna cost in terms of time for training. And sometimes you'll find that, you know, you keep on adding more hidden layers and you get no improvement in performance. And that, um, you know, it's an experiment you can try. So there's no, you know, hard and fast rule about the number of, of layers. Uh, it's just typically, you know, is the problem hard? Um, then you may need more layers. If the problem is simple, you may not have as many. It's one where you can do trial and error to find the optimum one, but also be aware that, you know, choosing 100 layers means that you'll probably wait till you retire until you get an answer from the program. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I think Steven has a question. Steven, go ahead, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, we haven't discussed this explicitly here, but on the topic of feature extraction, uh, I guess for more highly dimensional data sets, what are your thoughts on using some sort of dimensionality reduction, like principal component analysis as a form of uh, feature extraction before um, some other type of machine learning model being applied onto the data? 
Yeah, that's a really good point. It is a, a technique to do that. It's an approach you can can use. Um, so dimension introduction is it's a mathematical method, and so you can get some bizarre um, um, features if you want to say that you know what's my first principal component, my second principal component, and my third principal component. And those components may be, you know, you look at them and say, well, why did they put, you know, zodiac sign, hair color, and body mass index as, as the first principal component? You know, what do they have to do with each other? But that's just what the math said. Um, you could re-rationalize it and say that, you know, and where a person knowing more biology might say, well, the most important things, let's say it's for, I don't know, giantism, um, you know, trying to understand what are the, you know, the genes that affect giantism, but you need to have some clinical factors. So, you know, height more than seven feet, um, uh, length of jaw and nose, um, hand size versus foot size. Those are things that you would know as critically important as opposed to hair color, eye color, and zodiac sign. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, principal component analysis pulls out features that are not biologically sensible. Um, but um, sure, um, you can use principal component analysis to do uh, that feature reduction and, in essence, doing some feature selection. Thank you. There's another question from Kylie. Uh, what strategies can you use for feature extraction when you don't know very much about the event or disease, for example, biological mechanisms? Um, yeah, this is where I think if you're you know naive to the problem and naive to the data, um, machine learning is not going to help you a lot. Um, so it it's it it really um, um, you know, you, you can kind of blindly play along and try different things and, and maybe you'll be lucky. It's kind of like, you know, digging for gold. If, if you know nothing about where gold is found and you just say, well, I'm going to start digging in my own backyard, you're probably not going to find it. But if you know, um, you know, about certain minerals that are commonly associated with gold and you know, uh, where there have been hot spots and where there have been other mines that have found gold, uh, or you know about the geology and it has to be from a certain you know geological era, then you know that tells you that maybe this is a good place to start digging. Um, so you know, same thing for you know drilling for oil. They called it wildcatting. People would just randomly drill and hope they get something, and most of them failed. But then when people started using the knowledge about geology and you know drilling near where others had also drilled they started finding more oil um, um, so I, I think it's really important when you start a machine learning exercises to either get really familiar with the data you know read about the studies that have been done understand your problem more um, obviously you know if it's a brand new field then, then usually there's not much data on it so in that case, you know, machine learning needs data. And, and so again, it's probably not, a, not quite ready for it. Um, if I can add, Dr. Vishal, yeah, uh, maybe your comments also needed. We can also try with simple mechanisms such as clustering analysis and stuff like that so that, you know, we, uh, we can just see that which instances group together, which features group together, and some also along with that, some statistical analysis as well. That may help. In the first place? Yeah, I think that's often a way of just getting familiar with your data and um, seeing if there are trends. Um, remember, you know, the best machine learning device in the world still is your brain. Um, and, and this is how a lot of these things, particularly these features and feature extraction I'm talking about, are just things where smart people had noticed some interesting patterns and published on it. And if you collected those interesting patterns together, um, then you get a fairly powerful machine learning algorithm. So these are sort of independent discoveries published 20, 30 years ago. And by putting those things together into one algorithm using machine learning, 
um, you get something that's pretty useful. I think we have one more question in the chat from Desmond. If you don't know much about your data and wish to find relevant features, would something like lasso or ridge regression help in this case? Yeah, those are some of the feature extraction techniques. There's um, um, bagging and boosting and other feature selection, feature extraction. There's We talked about the Gini index analysis. Um, so those are, along with principal component analysis methods, approaches for doing feature extraction. Um, and all of them can work. Um, um, some are better than others, and some you know, depend on the data type. But yeah, that's certainly possible. OK, I think our time is up. I'm going to move on. Um, we can finish up on time here. Um, so this is another one that we were talking about. So feature extraction is the codon usage frequency. Um, so there's a difference between codon usage and coding DNA and non-coding DNA. And so some might be rare. And this is sort of illustrating well, the color scheme isn't exactly clear. The frequency of certain codons they're used in. Um, in this case, like you look at arginine, so CGC and CGU are very common, but AGA and AGG are almost never used, um, at least in coding regions. So the reverse is true for non-coding. Um, so we can look at codon frequencies. We can count the occurrence of each base at each position. Uh, and we, in this case, we're dividing by the total number of bases in the sequence, and then from that, we can actually get a, a sequence because there's uh, three bases in the codon. Um, and um, um, four variations, we get a, a vector of 12 uh, or four bases. So this vector of 12 um, has been calculated at the bottom here. So there's 12 numbers um, with the different associations with A, T, G, and C. Um, with the different codons. And so we have a, a frequency association. This uh, approach, uh, which was published, and we probably should have provided the um, reference, um, was something that was, I think, discovered in the probably the 80s. Um, and they also noticed that you didn't have to use all the information or all 12 numbers. You could actually um, use some information data, like the Shannon entropy concept. Um, and they used uh, this thing called H, which is sort of a, an entropy of the 12 points, but it allows you to replace the first element, which is the 0.24, with an entry, entropy parameter. Um, and in a minor way, it changed 0.24 to 0.12. But it is an algorithm that's been consistently proven to work for assessing codon frequencies in um, in gene coding regions. So as I say, it's something that was published in the 80s, just extracted from the paper. They showed that you could get pretty good um, identifications of, of coding and non-coding regions. And so that is the feature. The other important feature are these hexamers. So there's uh, 4,096 different hexamers, you know, 64 times 64. Um, and you can calculate the hexamer scores in promoter regions, terminator regions, uh, coding DNA, and non-coding DNA. So there's essentially four regions. And again, we, we can do this for uh, E. coli. We could have done it for other bacterial genome sequences because they've been characterized quite um, deeply. We can calculate their log ratios just to sort of normalize or scale them. Um, and you know, these are some examples. So just two hexamers, there's the ATT, AGC, um, and it's not used in promoters, not used in terminators, it's not used in co coding regions. On the other hand, the TAA, AAA, strongly used in promoters, strongly used in terminators, not found very much in coding regions. So this is one of you know, the 4,000 hexamers that you can calculate. Um, so you can go through your data um, 
and it could be E. coli, it could be other genomes, but this is where you go through your calculating and, and your training uh, if you want, you're collecting your features. Um, and, and so we've got various scores. We can also calculate them on the fly um, when we're analyzing our you know, genome to be predicted. There's another thing called uh, position-specific scoring matrices. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you've had some bioinformatics, you've probably heard about them, but these are you know, old ways, older ways developed again in the 80s for identifying uh, motifs in proteins and motifs in DNA. Um, and um, you can use position-specific scoring matrices, or I call them possums, to find, um, say, the Pribno box or the promoter regions. And I think you recall with the Pribno box, there was this minus 35, minus 10 region. Um, there's a separation between these things. Um, sometimes the separation is uh, 15 bases, 16 bases, 17 bases, 18 bases. And so uh, again, preparing the promoter box for these different regions, uh, for the different widths um, was something that was done. So I think there's five different possums that were made for different separations between the minus 35 and the minus 10 region. Um, and so from those different possums, you can then take a sequence, um, evaluate that and say, this is a good possum. So the higher the score, uh, the better, um, the lower the score, um, the worse. But it's still a feature. And so you can you know, slide this window along, perform the possum evaluation and say, yeah, I've got a strong Pribno box here. Um, the, um, sorry, I guess I said the, the possum because there's a log score would be the lowest score wins. So uh, not the highest score. So in this case, we found a possum box with a five, 4.97, which is the lowest one. Uh, and that gives us our location for the Pribno box. The other one was the ribosome binding site. Uh, that's the Shine Delgarno sequence. And again, you can have a possum. Um, and this one, the actual possum is shown um, here. Um, and we're just finding how many, where the A's and the, the G's are and how many they score. And we can slide this along and identify um, our best possum. So it's, it's again, using things that were mostly developed in the 1980s or identified in the 1980s uh, that people had found in prokaryotic genes um, and using kind of old technology, position-specific matrices. Uh, we could have used more advanced things like hidden Markov models, which allow for variable uh, gap penalties, but we just wanted to keep it simple. Just look for these locations, um, build up you know, the appropriate training data so that we can find these things consistently. Um, and we could have done it from, and a lot of these things were actually described for other genomes. Um, so they weren't sort of trained on our training data or trained on our testing data. Um, and so what we now have, instead of, you know, uh, open reading frames, which can range from, you know, 40 bases to 4,000 bases. Um, we now have a structure where there's basically um, trivial ORF finder, which says, you know, I've got 1.6 million ORFs. And then each of those ORFs is converted to a, um, an, a, an input of 32 features. So um, again, 1.6 million ORFs. We look at the code on usage feature in that ORF. We look at the hexamer scoring feature in that ORF. We look at the Pribno box uh, features outside that ORF and the Shine Delgarno features outside that ORF. Um, so 32 features instead of thousands of bases uh, are how we convert every so now every open reading frame, no matter how long or short it is, is essentially a, a vector of 32 inputs. Sorry, so this is interrupt. important. Yeah. Can I ask, would that just mean that each individual ORF is an observation, like a subject in this case? Am I thinking of that the right way? 
And then you have 32 features for every ORF. That's right. So it's okay. instead of, think of the ORFs, as I said, we're just using the, the, the very first program. That's the one that found the 1.3 um, or 1.6 million ORFs, whatever it was. So it's just finding start, stop, start, stop. Um, and now we're just trying to clean it up and say, okay, which ones are real ORFs and which ones aren't? And so now we're applying this neural net to do the cleanup. So we've got the trivial ORF finder. And then, um, so it's generating a lot of extraneous data, 1.6 million wild guesses, which only a tiny fraction are correct. But by converting every ORF to this um, feature vector of 32, then we can train it uh, on our training data to say, okay, what are the features that say this is a real ORF and what are the features that say it's not a real ORF? And so this is sort of a filter, uh, but it's a neural net filter. And um, um, that's, uh, as it turns out, how most gene or prokaryotic gene finding algorithms work. Okay, so um, we've got this GPAN, um, which is the uh, new algorithm that we're gonna try to identify bacterial genes. Uh, where we're using a neural net, but we're just using the primitive ORF finder. Uh, so we do exactly what we've done before um, with the Python, open things up. So the algorithm, a little more complicated, um, but I'll take you through it. So the first thing is, you know, read your data. Um, we're taking in the E. coli genome data, so we have to, um, you know, find the at least our gene position data to check our the quality of our predictions. But then we're just taking the um, forward and reverse strands that we're going to be analyzing. Uh, we do some verifying the data. That's checking for missing data. We have the codon function. We identify the start and stop, just as we've done. We create the OR function to find the minimum length. This is the old OR function. Um, we find the same things in the reading frames. So identify the start and stop. Um, then, then that's the old OR function. That was the one that we introduced at the beginning of the morning. And then next, we add these uh, other features. So that's the codon usage frequency and the entropy parameter. We calculate the hexamer counting and the hexamer scoring, um, both on the coding and the non-coding data. And then we have our possum scoring. So all of these things, the Shine del Garno um, and um, the um, Privno box calculation. Um, and so those ones uh, from what is it about line 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, those form the ANN with 32 input units and five hidden units to produce a, a zero one output is whether it's a um, coding or non-coding uh, ORF. So um, we import the functions for uh, Python, um, NumPy and Pandas. Uh, I'm not sure if Seaborn or Matt Potlib are used. Mark, are they used? Well, let me quickly check. Uh, don't think so. Let me get back to you. Yeah, because I thought I'd removed that from the. Anyways, um, so uh, just as before, we import the gene position data. This is the same code that we used before in writing our, our um, uh, first version of the uh, OR finder. Uh, we're reading the reverse complement and the forward one. We do some cleanup of the first lines. Again, same thing that we did. Uh, we have the codons, one, same thing as we did with the original OR finder. Um, um, same sort of thing with the different reading frames, 0, 1, 2, 3, um, all code from our original OR finder. Um, same description, the OR finder. Um, 
we're using the 40 base length, um, making sure that at least it's there. And then we're including the first stop, three, three stop codons. So all this is the code from that first or finder, the one that found the 1.6 million ones. Mark, did you find out if it used the Seaborn stuff? Yeah, at the very end. It is used at the very end. When we generate the plot, yeah. OK, all right. OK, so the real meat of this algorithm um, after this ORF calculator that generates you know, millions of false positives is this part on the determining the codon usage frequency, uh, the hexamer counting, the hexamer scoring, the promoter secret, Pribno box opossum, and the Shine Delgarno uh, scoring, and then the, the neural net. So uh, this is the code that's used to uh, help with the calculation of um, the codon frequency um, and the number of nucleotide occurrences in each frame position. Um, and then, of course, we have to calculate this over the length of the total open, open reading frame. Uh, we have this entropy parameter gamma, which we showed you how to calculate, and that's one minus h over h naught. Um, so this, as I said, it's an algorithm that was developed in the 80s. Uh, we're just simply implementing it, but it is a feature. Hexamers, again, something picked up in the 80s. We're just doing what others have done. Um, so it returns the number of each hexamer present. So there's 4,096 in any given data set. Obviously, there'll be lots of zeros in most ORFs. Uh, it's run on the coding and the non-coding, so we're calculating, and then we're looking at the promoter, terminator, and ORFs. Um, each hexamer is given a score um, based on the stuff that we already know from other uh, genome data sets about what's typically found in coding and non-coding. Um, so again, we're producing uh, feature values, and it's, you know, every open reading frame is getting these, so it's 32 input values. Then we do the position-specific scoring matrix. Um, so we're looking at the Pribno box, uh, and we're looking at ones that are you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, or 19 apart. Um, again, it could have been a little smarter and used a hidden Markov model, but this is easier to code. And so we calculate the possums for all of these Pribno boxes, uh, and we determine which promoters are our are, are strongest. Um, and again, we're looking in regions 100 base pairs upstream of the um, start position of every ORF. Then there's the Shine Delgarno one. So again, it's the possum looking for this AGG, AGG, uh, and assessing how, how well it performs. Um, and um, also, I guess, I'm not sure quite why this hexamer part was in there. That's been a while since we I looked at it. Um, and again, they're looking upstream of the um, open reading frame. Um, and we're looking over a range of, of um, possible codons. So again, it's the, the Shine Delgarno um, hunt that's done and, and assesses how good this one is. So this neural net basically boils down to um, a filter. We have a dumb algorithm that finds you know, 1.6 million open reading frames. Each of those is converted to a 32 feature vector. So the input is 32. Then the um, hidden layer is five units, uh, five input units. And the non, uh, the output is a zero or a one. Zero is for coding, one is for non-coding. So it's a fairly simple neural net. Um, the um, total number of lines for this gene finding program is huge. Um, so it's almost a thousand lines. And to be able to do all the feature extraction, finding the possums, calculating the hexamers is, takes a while. Um, when we trained it on the 3 million bases, it was fairly fast. Um, so the overall performance is you know, 73 seconds. Um, it, it will train every time you run it. So it's gonna be a little slow. Um, but you can also choose certain cells, um, and that's, that can be faster. Um, 
there's a question, Dr. Sorry, before we uh, from Lance, would we be able to identify redundant or non-useful features after the neural net training or testing, or is it that something you'd want to have done beforehand? Yeah, well, essentially, we've already chosen the the really good features. We, you know, we, we went through the literature, um, found what what people all agreed worked um, or was helpful. Um, you know, we could have said, oh, we'll also calculate the zodiac sign or something else into this, um, and then maybe evaluate which of those features were really good. Some of the features are better um, than others. I think the hexamer tends to be better than the codon frequency. Uh, I think the um, Shine Del Garno one wasn't as useful as we'd hoped. And just sort of, this is from memory, but they're they all help and and you can you know do some experiments where you you know, knock out one of the features or um and see what your performance is but in this one because we were using i'll call it intelligent feature selection all of the features are are useful Okay, so um, you know we can test on it, and then we can also um, um, validate it. So there were, as I said, several iterations, and I'm just trying to make people remember these numbers. So um, our very first predictor, the simple ORF finder, which we're still using in this modified one, did terribly. Yes, it was able to identify genes 91% of the time, about 4,200 out of the 4,400 known. Um, but it, it mi had millions of false positives. It overpredicted by 1.63 million. Um, so that's made it a, a totally useless predictor, but there was some value in this because we realized we could create a filter that would get rid of those false positives. Then we used um, the simple uh, neural net um, where we used a nine residue nine base window. And again, where we just sort of said, oh, this should be just like um, secondary structure prediction and it should be even simpler. And you, you know, train it and run it and, and you can get a, not as bad as this, the naive ORF one in the sense that you had a 1.00 or 0.999 uh, false positive. Um, uh, but it, you know, it's still, was not at the 90% level that we needed to in terms of the diagonal. So it, it has a, an average performance of, I don't know, um, 51, 55%, which isn't great. Now, if we just put in the codon frequency statistics, um, this is this version where we, we filtered. Um, we go from, um, you know, numbers that we had here, 0 0.4, 0 0.73, um, to 0 0.92 and 0 0.91. So that's 92% finding the genes and 91% finding the non-coding regions. And we have sort of about a seven or 8% error on the off diagonal elements. So this is just in, incorporating the codon frequency. That's the 12, ve 12 point vector that we talked about. Um, so we could have almost just stopped there and said, we're done. But if we use the hexamer statistics, we actually get slightly better improvement. Um, um, and then if we include the possums uh, for the promoter region, um, we get better still. And then we had a, a more sophisticated one for um, some of the promoters. We used a hidden Markov model, but we'll talk about that. And in fact, the performance uh, got up to more than 93, 94% in the predicted genes. And the actual genes uh, are the false positive drop below 7%. So I'll just you know, go through this again, because I think it's really important. You know, simple or finder. Um, find a lot of genes, but we have millions of false positives. We try a, a naive neural net. 
Uh, we don't have millions of false positives anymore, but we're still pretty bad at predicting genes. So we redo it and just take the ORF finder and just include the codon frequency statistics on the ORFs. And as I said, this gets us up to 92, 91%, and sort of an 8 to 9% uh, false positive, uh, false negative stuff. These things start dropping as we add more on hexamer statistics, awesome promoters, and it gets down to 7% false positives. And then afterwards, if we have a more sophisticated one, it's well below 7%. Um, so we basically used um, a neural net to act as a filter, and uh, the improvement is, is enormous. And this gene predictor, this type of performance for a gene predictor, would be close to you know, some of the better gene predictors that have been published. Uh, and and you know, this is not terribly sophisticated. So, so we've got a gene predictor. It's been written in all Python. It predicts prokaryotic genes. We've trained and also tested on um, E. coli genes. It would be able to do it for other prokaryotic genes. It might not do quite as well. If we wanted to do something for eukaryotic gene locations, um, it would be a lot more complicated. Um, there's many more features, but you could still use a naive sort of gene finder that would sort of say, oh, there's a whole bunch of genes here and then do this filtering thing where you look for the features and convert these you know, potential exon regions into um, you know, feature vectors of 30 or 100 input vectors where you, you're using some intelligent feature selection. Um, now, we're gonna use the last, I don't know, 20 minutes here for people to just play around with this. Um, we had been working on the R code, um, trying to fix it up because there was something that happened to it. Unfortunately, the R code um, still hasn't been uh, finalized. So those of you who are hoping to have R code, we won't have it for you this time. But when we were um, running it a couple of years ago, it was taking you know, 15 minutes. So the point, it was you know, impractical for people to use it. And this sort of highlights this issue where there are situations where Python is much, much better than R, um, especially for speed. Um, R for some people is, you know, if you're familiar with it, it's easy to code. It's maybe a little more intuitive in general. Um, and for simple statistics, it's a lot faster than Python to write. Um, but for some of the more complicated things in machine learning, um, it is, uh, sometimes not the, the best choice. 